And as I share with you this message, I uh, would have to just remind you that there are some important things about our God. First of all, His providence. We saw that this morning in His mercy. Uh, and I hope that for the rest of our life we'll carry with us the thought that if we got what we deserved, we would be dead. But because of His mercy, everything that we enjoy today is because of His mercy. And we live in His grace. And oftentimes we equate out things in God's providence and we give our own understanding of it. As I spoke this morning, His providence encompasses many things, but it's filtered through a skewed human view, a world view, that oftentimes is difficult to see through. God gives us enough evidence of who He is and what He's done. In fact, in the Gospel of John, at the end of the Gospel of John, you'll find in chapter 21, verse 25, a very interesting statement made by John as he shares of the greatness of God and the things that God has shown. I'll share this again later, but it's interesting that in our world today, this is just kind of a caveat, kind of a side note. In our world today, there are a lot of people that are seeking after healings and all sorts of things, and they travel around to, to hear these healing ministries, and you hear about uh, the Catholics bringing in folks that have healing and ministries and other denominations and everything, and people just swoon and go, oh my goodness, this must have been what it was like when Jesus was around. It's interesting, though, that when Jesus was doing it, people heard from all over, and they came to be healed by Jesus. In fact, it's probably one of the healthiest generations in history, because everywhere he went, and not only where he went, but everywhere that they heard of him, they would send their sick and their infirmed to him to be healed. And if you'll notice with the disciples, there are a couple of occasions where uh, they mentioned this, like about Peter and touching the, his garments and stuff like that. But you don't see people flocking to Paul. You don't see people flocking to Peter their whole ministry. You don't see that in the other disciples, so it's unique that, that Christ had the power of God utilized through the Holy Spirit to be able to share, and it was a time in which God used it to manifest Himself in the greatness of who He was and through His Son and what would be accomplished at Calvary. Jesus didn't come so that He could do all of the healings. The healings were manifestations of the greatness of God incarnate in Christ Jesus. He says at the end of this, though, at the end of this book, he says, there's so many more things. In fact, let's let Scripture speak for itself in the 25th uh, verse of chapter 21. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So if you could imagine, this is for straight from the Gospel of John, the last verses of the Gospel of John, and he tells us we couldn't write down everything that he did because they were so numerous. Uh, there's a song that says if, if uh, the, the ocean was an inkwell and, and uh, the sky was parchment and every tree a quill to be able to write with, you would run the ocean dry and fill the sky to where you couldn't write anything more and still have more to say about the greatness of God. Amen. And John says that at the end of this, and he speaks of the miracles and the great things that Jesus Christ did. And one of those great things we see is in chapter 9 of the book of John. There are seven miracle-type things that take place in John. In these miracles, there are three healings. One resurrection, two uh, were, were involving food, and one where Jesus was walking on water. This is one of the reasons I'm a Baptist, because two of them had to do with some kind of event, like a wedding or feeding a bunch of people. That's Baptist. It's Baptist and gifts, so I want you to know you're in good company because of that. He turned the water to wine in chapter 2, the healing of the official son in chapter 4, the healing of the paralytic in chapter 5, 
the feeding of the multitude in chapter 6, the walking on the water in chapter 6, the healing of the blind man in chapter 9, the one we're going to deal with, and the final one, which was the resurrection, the raising of Lazarus. Wow. All of that was done in John. We see that there's other places where it harmonizes with some of the other Gospels. But this particular story in chapter 9, the healing of the blind man, does not occur in the other Gospels. It's interesting because this particular story and, and the story of the, the, uh, the paralytic that was healed at the pool of Bethesda uh, isn't mentioned in the other Gospels. Now, we have other paralytics that are healed, but if you look at them, there's the ones that the, the four friends brought them and everything like that. Uh, there, there's one where uh, there's a confrontation with Pharisees and Jesus has already healed the man, but it wasn't the pool of Bethesda because it was in Capernaum when it took place, so we know it wasn't in Jerusalem. So when we look at those things, these are kind of unique to this particular gospel, and because they are, one of the things that I want you to see in this passage in chapter 1, or chapter 9, verse 1, it says, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he would be born blind. Now, later in the chapter, in verse 32, they're going to acknowledge the fact that this man was born blind, and they had never, the, the religious leaders of the day, had never heard of anyone who had been born blind ever being healed. That's why it points out the fact that he had been born blind. There were those who went blind because of disease or because of injury or whatever the case may be, but this person has never seen anything within their whole lifetime. And so this was a, a huge thing to them because that was even their question. In fact, when they said, is, is this guy trying to preach to us? Is he trying to teach us something? And immediately it says they threw him out, kicked him out of the synagogue and told him he couldn't have any more business in there with them. So we see that this is kind of a unique thing, but the disciples asked a very perplexing question, but it was probably what they understood in the Jewish economy of sin. Usually, if somebody had a disease or infirmity or leprosy or something like that, it was because they had done something wrong. But this man had done nothing wrong. He had it from birth. Did he sin in the womb? No. Did his parents do something? Well, Jesus says they didn't. I heard some preachers say, in fact, that even made the mistake saying, God made him that way. No. Sin, he was born into a sinful world, and part of that was this sin uh, that was in this world, it had nothing to do with his sin, his parents' sin, but the reality of it is, that's why we talked about mercy this morning, he was born into a world of sin. And because of that, he was about to experience a miracle of God, and the first thing that he was going to see when he opened his eyes, was the glory of God manifested in him. It was the tragedy of a life. It was a horrible thing to have blindness during that time. You had to be led anywhere you went. Everyone had to take care of you, basically. And nobody really gave a great deal of care to you, just like they did with the lame people. They were usually laying and begging somewhere. Or, or blind and begging somewhere. And so when Jesus passes through and the disciples say this, they automatically go back to what they understood of their teaching from their Jewish heritage. Surely this person has done something wrong or there's some kind of difficulty that this man is the way that he is. You know, they never ask the question, Lord, why don't you heal him? Lord, we've watched you heal others. It's interesting that they were ready and prepared to judge him or at least find out what, what the judgment was. It's kind of like, Lord, how many times should I forgive my neighbor? Seven times? No, no, no. 70 times 7, 490 times for the same offense. It's always interesting when they're asking their questions, sometimes it looks like they're trying to promote their own righteousness to be able to say, we're not like that man. Or we're not like that person. That was the mistake of the Pharisees. Thank you, God, I'm not like him. The reality is you're more like him than you think you are. And so as, as they ask this question, it, they, they, they may be looking at it from the perspective of, how righteous am I? Lord, let me, let me judge him for a minute. The Bible tells us that the ultimate judge is not us. We are flawed in our judgments. How many of you have ever made a mistake in one of your judgments? Amen. Yeah. All of us have. And so they were looking to, to vindicate whatever thought process had come into their head. Now that's where we need to change our thought processes 
from, I, I, you know, did they do this to sin uh, because of their sin? Are they this way or, or that way? Uh, we need to stop and, and take it for what it's worth and say, God, how can we use this to your glory? How can this situation within, Lord, how are we going to use this? I don't know why they're that way, but Lord, you do. And I believe that you can use it to your honor and your glory. We don't pray like that, do we? We usually say, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that person. Because we've automatically judged where they are. We don't know their history. We don't know their background. I think it's interesting that he makes a point of he was blind since birth. That's all he had ever known. So he'd done nothing wrong. So we see that sin isn't always the cause of infirmity, suffering, pain, um, and things of that nature. But sometimes it is. Does sin cause suffering? Yeah, it does. And I can guarantee you that you've done things that are wrong, and I've done things that are wrong, and I've suffered for them just as you have suffered for them. We're not talking about that with this man. We're talking about us doing something wrong, and because of it, we suffer the consequences of whatever we have sown. And the Bible teaches us that. It's not that God comes down and zaps us. He doesn't say, hmm, okay, well, you did this, so, uh, you know, you talked bad to this person or that person, so I'm going to give you boils. Can God do that? Yep, he can. But usually he said, you talk bad to this person, and I'm going to let you reap the consequences of that because it's going to cost you something in that relationship. There will be a day that ultimately he judges all the things that we've done when we stand before him. And the cool thing about it for Christians is we're covered by the blood of Jesus. That doesn't give us license to go out and do evil or mean or rotten things. That gives us a responsibility to live in the knowledge and the light of what Jesus Christ has afforded us through his blood. See the importance of that? You see why we need to say thank you, Lord, and live in such a way that shows who we belong to? But what about suffering when it comes into your life? What about those things? When it comes into our life because we have done something wrong, it's interesting. Jesus always tells them, don't do it anymore. I love that part. You know, everybody says, oh, well, Jesus said, you that don't have uh, any sin throw the first drop. And I was right. And then he told her, go and sin no more. Because if you leave that out, you miss the whole point of it. Sometimes our suffering comes because of our sin, and we need to be told, stop it. Especially if God's Word tells us to, that we shouldn't be involved in it. And so often people come, and they want to act as if they're the blind guy who's been blind since birth, but yet they know that the things they've done in their past, and the things that they have covered up, and the things they've protected, and all that have created the situation that they're in, but they want me to, tre to, to treat, treat them like they're the blind guy, that it's always been this way, and there's just nothing I've ever been able to do about it. That's where we need to come to grips with the reality of God's Word, and say, Lord, forgive me for that. And stop doing it. Isn't that the cool part? Stop being that doormat. Stop being that facilitator. Stop being the, the catalyst for the problem. Stop being that. If you're a gossip, you say, I wonder why people don't like talking to me. Stop gossiping. Maybe they'll talk to you. Isn't that cool how that works? Well, in the case of the woman caught in adultery, we, we find this story in, in, in John chapter 8. Jesus straightening up in verse 10 of chapter 8 said to the woman, where are, where are they, those that accuse you? You know, the ones that condemned you. She said, no one, Lord, is, is condemning. No one's here. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on. Sin no more. Stop it. There's another story uh, of another man that... Um, is, is lame in John chapter 5 and it, it mirrors this picture in John chapter 9 but in John chapter 5 uh, this lame man is healed and afterwards Jesus found him in the temple and said to him in John chapter 5 verse 14 he said to him behold you have become well do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you if you remember this story this is the story of the man at the pool of Bethesda remember Jesus comes and says do you want to be healed? Well, I've been this way for 30 some odd years. 
Now, it's interesting because it doesn't say that he was lame from birth. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say this has been a lifelong thing. He could have been injured as a child or as a young man, and for 38 years he had been a paralytic, a cripple. He could have fallen. He could have been dropped uh, like uh, uh, Mephibosheth, um, a, whatever the case may be. He could have been dropped or... Uh, but whatever the case may be, it could have been from something sinful he did. But Jesus gives him the same thing that he tells her. Don't do the sin. Whatever it was. And you say, well, you're speculating way too far beyond that. Well, wait a minute. It doesn't tell us that this man had this condition since birth. He had it for a period of time. And he says, stop. Don't do sin. Well... Sometimes our suffering is not, direct, is not a direct result of sin, though. And these cases that I've just mentioned, they were doing apparently something, and we know from the, the, the woman caught in adultery, we know that that was wrong. Anybody here think that that isn't wrong? Okay, I just wanted to be sure that I didn't have any counseling to do after services tonight. Okay. Uh, so he says, yeah, sometimes the suffering comes because you've created it, but sometimes it comes, and when you're living righteously and trying to do what the Lord wants, and sometimes suffering comes into your life, and you know what? It's not because you've done something wrong. It's because God has a mission for you as the potter for the clay. He may need you to be a bowl this week. He may need you to be a plate this week. He may need to break you or reduce you back down to moldable clay. Whatever the case may be, when we surrendered ourselves to him, we said, you're the potter, I'm the clay. Mold me and make me, as the psalm says, after thy will, while I'm doing what? Waiting, yielded, and still. Waiting on you. So when we, we, we look at this, we have to know that sometimes suffering is not a direct result of sin. Here again, I want to go back to the man here at the, in this situation. He was blind from birth. F.F. Uh, Bruce um, wrote something I thought was very interesting about this. The truth was that like Job, the blind man was afflicted so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Bruce said this, this does not mean that God deliberately caused the child to be born blind in order that after many years his glory should be displayed in the removal of the blindness. To think so would again be an aspiration on the character of God. It does mean that God overruled the disaster of the child's blindness so that when the child grew to manhood, he might be, he might, by recovering his sight, see the glory of God in the face of Christ, and others seeing this work of God might turn to the true light of the world. You see the difference? It wasn't that God said, all right, you're going to be blind because I want you to be blind for my glory. He was blind because that's how he was born. You say, well, if God's in control of everything, then he made him blind. You have to remember he's being born into a world of sin. There's a lot of things that cause blindness that God says, I didn't cause that. However, I know that it's going to be there and I'm going to use it to my glory. All things, good and bad, work to the glory of God. Because he is the prime mover in history and in eternity. So when we see this, we see that sometimes our sin or our, our suffering is not the result of sin. In fact, Jesus said, neither this man, in our, in our passage in chapter 9, neither this man sinned nor his parents. But it was so that the work of God might be displayed in him. He doesn't say, he's that way to the glory of God. He says, he's that way so that the power of God can be displayed and shown and showcased for all to see. Wouldn't it be cool to be, and, and you might think, oh, wow, it would be terrible to be blind. But what if your blindness was so that God could display himself in you? I don't know about you, but that seems in my mind to just be awesome. You may sit there and go, oh, why me, why me? In fact, Job, Job's friend said you ought to be that way. Didn't they? You've done something wrong, Job. Something's not right. But wait a minute, God was displaying the greatness of who he was in Job, in this man. And at various different places in God's word, we see 
God displaying himself. Job's friends, when Job couldn't be counseled, uh, rested their case for his suffering on this wrong assumption. They caused him needless misery. When you look at the passage over in Job 13, 1, uh, 13, 1 through 13 and 61 through 4, and ultimately received a rebuke from the Lord in 42, 7. The Lord said, what are you doing giving him counsel that's not mine? What are you doing telling him these things? I don't know about you, but there's one thing that I, I dread. I would hate to ever have my Lord and my Master and my Savior say to me, what are you telling them? It's not true. That would be the scariest thing for me to hear. Could you imagine God saying, that ain't what I said. That doesn't cause you to tremble in fear that something's wrong with you. We don't live in a simple world in which good things always happen to good people and bad things always happen to bad people. Next Sunday morning, I'm going to be talking about a tower that was built and fell, part of the temple. We're going to be talking about some who were in Galilee who were sacrificing. We're going to talk about the providence of God and all of that because it comes back to some of the very things we looked at this morning. We hear from these ideas that suffering is a direct result of sin or not a direct result. Some of the wrong statements people often make, often make is you are suffering, you must have sinned. That's what the disciples said. How often do we see someone in misery or something like that? And our first assumption is you must be sinning. And before we know anything, we've automatically made that judgment. I have learned that before I do that, I really need to find out what's going on. Not so that I can be their judge and their jury but so that I can help them appropriately because if they're needing uh, uh, a counsel, if they're needing uh, help, I want to be sure and give them the help they need rather than assuming they're already guilty because it looks like their they're sin or their suffering is caused by sin. We have to be careful of that because there again we find Job's friends. <laughs> uh, they were chided by God. They were told, you're wrong. The second wrong statement people often make is you are suffering and you don't have enough faith. My mother, when, when I was growing up, she had a lot of, of sickness. And we had a family. They'd gone on to be with the Lord in the church. They were very much in the Pentecostal movement and everything. I don't know how to become a part of the Baptist church, but he was a, a Pentecostal preacher. And, and i got to tell you, she was a firebrand. She was just awesomely wonderful lady in the church. But I'll never forget, I still have in my office, I'd have to find it, but I know that it's there, a two-page letter from the Brunsons stating that my dad and my mom didn't have enough faith because that's why mom was always sick. If we had enough faith, mom wouldn't be sick. And he must not be a very good preacher because mom was sick. And he must not have had enough faith to pray her out of it. And in this letter, I mean, they cited scriptures and stuff, wrongly so, but they did it. And I kept the letter because the only question that, and my dad wrote them back, a very wonderful little retort, not trying to be uh, foolish or, or condescending, but he said, what about Paul? Are you telling me Paul didn't have enough faith? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 7, it says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that, I might, that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insult, with distress, with persecution, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. Wow. I'd have to rip that right out of the Bible if I, I were to, to start telling people, listen, the reason that you're sick and the reason you have problems is because you're just, you don't have enough faith. There is a place that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians about the Lord's Supper. He says that you're misusing it and doing it wrong. And he tells them how they're doing it wrong. He says you need to be doing it right. You need to be doing it. And the reason that many of you are sick and many of you are infirmed and some of you have even gone to sleep, in other words, died over this, was because you were making a mockery of the things of God. But you know what? It was very clear on what those things of God were. Again, it was visible sin that they were practicing in making a mockery 
of what was supposed to be precious because of its institution and its meaning. Well, in this, I have to ask the question of those who make that statement, if you are suffering, you don't have enough faith. I have to answer them, what about Paul? What about the thorn in his flesh? And how God saw him through it. Well, God can use suffering to bring glory to himself. We've already talked about the fact that uh, this person was blind and it brought glory to God, not because he was blind, but because he was healed. You see the, the difference in that? Because of the healing that took place, God brought to his life something that he had never experienced, the fullness of what we talked about this morning in mercy, having never been able to see, and now the mercy of God. And if you notice, it doesn't say, and the man got up and followed Jesus. It doesn't say that. In fact, he puts a salve on his eyes, some spittle, and puts it on and tells him to go wash. And when he washes, he wow, and, and, and he gets word back that it was Jesus. And so he starts telling everybody, and the, the rulers come and say, all right, let's do the inquisition with him. And they take him in and in, inquire of him, and we're going to talk about that more next week. But in it, all he could say was, I was blind, and now I can see. And people said he was blind, and now he can see. And the, the religious leader said, that can't be. It's never happened that someone has regained their sight having been born blind. There wasn't any hope of that. But isn't it great how Christ brings hope to the hopeless situations? To the things that oftentimes we can't see the fullness of? In the providence of God, as we unfolded in these next few weeks, and, and, and I... I pray that I can do it in such a way that it would bring glory to God and that it would bring clarity to you and not be confusing to you. But isn't it great how God can take things that look hopeless, that everyone say can't be done, and he says, but I'm God. And it can be. When we see this, we see that this suffering was to the glory of the Father. You know, Isaiah 53 speaks of that same kind of suffering. In Isaiah 53, verse 3, it says, He was despised. You know this passage. I'm going to read it for you anyway. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Let me finish this, because I want to... Surely our griefs he has borne, and our sorrows he has carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, do you know that's exactly what the disciples were asking Jesus? Why is he this way? Because of his sins or because of the sins of his parents? It says in that passage, we consider Jesus to be smitten and stricken of God because he's done something wrong. You may have never caught that in there. When you get to it in your studies in Isaiah, probably in about six years, when you get down, I'm joking, it's a wonderful study. But the thing about it was, that's the way Isaiah portrays it as well. You declared him to be sinful. You declared him to be deserving of this and that God was allowing all of this to happen to him because he had done some kind of something wrong. But we know that he suffered not because he deserved it. He suffered because. He suffered all of those things. In fact, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, what do you say? If this cup can be passed, let it. But not my life. But yours be done. Did you see the picture of that? What did Jesus do wrong? About me. So we can see in this the example of how God can take that suffering and use it to his glory. And one of the best examples we have is not only this man that was born blind, but also in the greatness of what we see in Christ coming and being our I don't know about you, but when I study these things and I consider all that God has done, and I look at these and put them in perspective to the overall picture of of Scripture, how could people not? How could Christians not know? How could we miss such wonderful truths about our great God?
And the only thing that I can say to that is not a, a whip on your back. I would just say to you to know these things. Some of these things you're going, wow, I didn't know those things. Believe it or not, the Bible is full of those kind of things. And when you see them, it's an awesome experience to be able to say, wow, our God does have everything, everything in control. He does know what's going on. He knows about the hurting. He knows everything. And we live in His mercy. And by faith, we experience His grace. How would we not want to know about it? I would just encourage you. And the thing you say, wow, that's cool. If it's cool, and you think that it's wonderful, and you say, that's my God, then find out more about it. Learn more about it. Watch Him as He works in your life. And I would say to you the same thing that I said this morning. When things are going wrong in your life and you've evaluated your life and you've asked God, Lord, have I done something wrong? And he responds back, no. Instead of saying, then why me, Lord? I have ask the question, why not me? Lord, use me to your honor and your glory through whatever suffering, through whatever joys, through whatever difficulties, through whatever successes. You know, so often we just get caught up on the, the, the pain and the suffering, don't we? But you know, God allows us to be raised as well. Do we still ask the same question? Lord, how do you want to bring glory to you? In my successes and in my suffering. How can I show others through my life that you're God? Would you stand with me?